We're good. All right. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good morning. Good morning to everyone he with us here in Glasgow. Uh, and welcome to those from around the world who are listening to us online. Uh, my name is Ahmed Saith. I'm Vice President for East Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific at the Asian Development Bank. And it's my distinct privilege uh, on behalf of President Massa and our colleagues to welcome you to the launch of the Energy Transition Mechanism for Southeast Asia Partnership launch event. And a special thanks to Sustainable Energy for All and the Rockefeller Foundation for the generous use of this pavilion and for your fantastic support. The backdrop for COP26 is well understood, and it is daunting. Together, we must tilt the world on its axis, ushering in a new decarbonized future. We must act quickly, firmly committed to a transition that is just and humane, and one that leaves no one behind. ADB and two of its important member governments, those of Indonesia and the Philippines, will today be announcing our partnership to design an energy transition mechanism based on the concept originally developed by Don Kanak. This partnership will accelerate the decarbonization of energy systems and thereby vastly expand the scope for the growth of renewables. It is based on the conviction that our shared goals demand replicable and scalable platform-based solutions that engage market actors, incentivize voluntary actions, and that are designed by developing countries themselves as a response to local circumstances that they understand better than anyone else. The ambitions of the group assembled here today are very large. They are to make a significant dent in global greenhouse gas emissions, first in our region, and then to scale up around the world. None of this is possible without cooperation, without partnerships. So I want to express special appreciation to those in this room and those joining us virtually, from governments, philanthropies, civil society, and private companies from all over the world. We are all united by a shared commitment to work together to address humanity's most pressing challenge while also ensuring dignity and security for all. Over the next 90 minutes, you will hear from those working with us to make ETM a reality. To welcome us on behalf of the United Kingdom, host country of COP26, I'd like to begin by asking the Honorable Helen Waitley, Exchequer Secretary of the Secretary of the UK, to please give us some opening remarks. Secretary. Sound on okay? Okay, there we go. Good morning, everybody. I'm delighted to have the chance to speak at this morning's partnership launch. To keep the Paris Agreement's 1.5 degree C goal in reach, the world needs to rapidly switch away from coal power to clean energy. And this transition needs to happen, not just in pockets of the globe, but everywhere. So I'm delighted that Indonesia, the Philippines, and the Asian Development Bank are launching this partnership to design an energy transition mechanism to accelerate the transition from coal to clean energy in Southeast Asia. I'm sure it will play a big part in helping Southeast Asia make the shift to net zero and to do this faster and more fairly. This important initiative aims to help younger coal power plants close while boosting the growth of renewable energy. As we all know, coal power stations can operate for up to half a century. Given that long potential lifespan, Choosing to retire recently installed plants, I know, can pose a major financial headache. An energy transition mechanism should help to overcome these difficulties by offsetting lost revenue from early retirement. As they design the ETM, the partners know the importance of making sure that this genuinely accelerates the shift to cleaner energy by bringing about the early retirement of power stations, not simply supporting closure of old ones that will be due to close soon anyway. And rightly, I know the partners are committed to a just and equitable shift away from coal for the communities and the workers affected. It's crucial that those who are affected by the transition to net zero can move into good jobs and that vulnerable communities are supported. And finance ministries in particular have a key role to play here in ensuring that the transition is not only orderly, but positive for jobs, growth, competitiveness, and fairness. I'm glad to say that UK representatives will be talking in more detail about our work on just transition at tomorrow's open, opening plenary session. 
Now, I'm sure that you've gathered that the UK is a real supporter of this partnership and of this approach. In fact, we have been teaming up with other countries to develop similar schemes. That includes our work with the US, Germany, and Canada to support the climate investment funds and help design the accelerating coal transition facility. I'd also like to say just a few words about our domestic efforts to move away from coal to sustainable fuels. This, of course, is with the caveat that I recognize the situation here in the UK is very different to that in Southeast Asia. Nine years ago, 40% of our electricity was generated by coal. But I'm proud to say that that figure stands at less than 2% today, with a complete phase-out date of 2024. And at the same time, we have substantially driven down the cost of offshore wind, becoming a world leader for this sector. We've driven this progress with a combination of carbon pricing, generation capacity and renewable energy support mechanisms, which have helped us to cut power emissions by over 70% in just over three decades. But I assure delegates, even with this progress, we know how important it is for us to press on at pace to reduce our emissions further. So to conclude, we all know we have a long and challenging path ahead of us to reach global net zero, but it's only by working together that we will reach our destination. And this partnership exemplifies that. I wish it every success. Thank you, uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Whiteley, for those uh, very kind and, and wonderful remarks. And we're grateful to the UK government for its support. Next, we're going to hear a video message from the Honorable Janet Yellen, Secretary of the Treasury of the United States of America. Hello, everyone. This is Janet Yellen, the United States Treasury Secretary, and I want to thank the Asian Development Bank for the chance to share a few thoughts during this important event launching the energy transition mechanism and during this historic moment in Glasgow. Climate change is the great collective action problem of our time. We know that there can be no such thing as a national solution to the climate crisis. The United States cannot by itself limit global warming to well below one and a half degrees, the goal from Paris. Addressing the existential threat of climate change will require a global achievement with all of us acting in concert. And the recent International Energy Agency Net Zero by 2050 report it was very clear about what one piece of that achievement must be. Every nation, developed or developing, has to decommission their unabated coal power plants as quickly as possible, and certainly no later than 2040. No coal generation with unabated greenhouse gas emissions by 2040. That is a global goal, a global imperative. It's the same everywhere. But of course, the challenge of reaching it isn't. In places like Europe and the United States, most of the remaining coal plants will be reaching or have already reached the end of their useful lives by 2040. They'll have to be retired anyway. But this isn't the case in many emerging economies where coal fleets are newer and in some cases coal power is still coming online today. Decommissioning newer plants will be a much more difficult challenge, although still an absolutely essential one. This will require public finance and the involvement of the multilateral development banks. Indeed, this is a tough, knotty problem. That is why I'm pleased by the Asian Development Bank's work to accelerate the decommissioning of coal facilities. The world needs forward thinking, creative approaches to financing, especially from the multilateral development banks. And we need to find creative solutions so that our public funds crowd in additional private investment as the bank is aiming to do here. I look forward to the further development of a number of financing approaches, 
so that countries around the world can have several models to consider as they develop their approach to energy transition. And I'd like to add a few ideas, which I hope are helpful to the discussion. Any arrangement to facilitate the transition away from coal should, con should contain certain design elements. First, it should incentivize decommissioning unabated coal assets as urgently as possible. Second, partner countries need to commit to a whole of economy transition away from unabated coal so that we're supporting strategies that encourage a rapid expansion of clean and renewable electricity generation and associated transmission infrastructure and not encouraging investment in other fossil generation. And third, we need to be sure that environmental and social safeguards and standards are strong and provide for a just and equitable transition for affected communities. Again, let me stress how pleased I am that the Asian Development Bank is thinking creatively about the task of greening our global economy by putting forward the energy transition mechanism. The US Treasury is looking forward to seeing how the Asian Development Bank and other MDB's efforts in this area develop further. Thank you. We're, we're very grateful for those words of support from the United States. And next, it's my privilege uh, to invite the Honorable Ibu Sri Mulyani, Minister of Finance of Indonesia and Chair of the Coalition of G20 Finance Ministers for Climate Action, the Honorable Carlos Dominguez, Secretary of Finance and Chairperson Designate of the Climate Change Commission of the Philippines, and President Asakawa of the Asian Development Bank to join us on stage. Uh, and please join us uh, for the launch uh, of this partnership. Please. And, uh, Minister Simulmani, if, if we could ask you to first uh, share some remarks. You're welcome to do that seated, or you're also welcome to come to the lectern, whatever. Let me, yeah, please. Let me do it there. All right. Thank you, Zaid. Uh, Honorable, uh, my friend, Sony, uh, uh, President Asakawa, Miss um, um, Janet Yellen, which is uh, present here from uh, the Zoom, uh, and my colleague from the uh, UK Chancellor, the Exchequer. I would like to express first my appreciation uh, on behalf of the government of Indonesia to the Asian Development Bank and, the all, and, and all parties involved today for this uh, energy transition mechanism partnership launch. The launching is definitely very timely, particularly at the onset of the COP26. This is surely an important momentum calling for both developed countries to deliver their climate financing commitment with a real and implementable initiative and for all of us in the emerging and developing country to start preparing our framework credibly and coherently so that we are going to be able to continue develop while at the same time also committing to the net zero emission. We look forward to the conclusion uh, of the study and discussion to continue shaping the platform of the ETM because energy is the biggest part and the most costly for the transition toward net zero. It's the biggest part and the most costly. This is I'm going to really emphasize as a finance minister. Indonesia has put the highest priority on the energy transition toward energy, uh, cleaner energy. But Indonesia will continue growing. And that's why we will need more energy. So the challenge for us, as mentioned earlier, is how we are going to combine both in terms of reducing the CO2 from the existing uh, energy while at the same time building new energy cleaner to satisfy the continued uh, demand which is going to continue growing. 
To address this, we require a combination of pace of controlling or retiring coal-fired power and simultaneously to develop an alternative renewable energy. In our region, wants to be, if, if the region in this case and our own country want to be more ambitious, we definitely need the energy transition mechanism, which is uh, currently also a very good initiative from the ADB. So I really appreciate President Asakawa for this initiative. Indonesia has committed to reduce our emission by 29% in 2030 and increasing the share of renewable energy in our country energy mix to 23% by 2025. In addition, we also embark a transition to achieve net zero emission by 2060 or sooner in our long term on low carbon and climate resilient strategy. Indonesia Power Utility State-Owned Enterprise, PT PLN, in May 2021 has announced that it is aiming to phase out coal-fired power as part of our larger efforts to achieve carbon neutrality, including the plan to stop building new coal-fired plants after 2023. Decommissioning of these coal-fired power plants is one of the key action as part of the transition to a lower carbon economy, and the ETM definitely can assist and facilitate this process. The ETM is an ambitious plan that enable for all of us in Indonesia to upgrade the Indonesia energy infrastructure and accelerate the clean energy transition toward net zero emission in a just and affordable manner. Uh, I know that everybody talking about just, but as a finance minister, I will also emphasize affordability. And when I'm talking about affordability, it should be measured in at least three dimensions. First, for the population, which is still continue need to get energy, they should be able to buy the energy at their purchasing power. I think this is critical. Second, industry who also use energy, they need to also get the energy in the cleanest, efficient, as well as affordable way. And the third is for the government budget. Sony and I, both finance minister, and we know exactly well. This transition will require many of the commitment on a state budget. The new investment on a, on a new renewable in this case, so it will require capital spending. Although we are going to do the catalytic for the private sector, but public finance cannot be eliminated on that. The second one in this case is for us to be able to also create a subsidy or premium so that renewable is going to be competitive enough. It's not, it should not that you transit into renewable then everything is going to be too expensive to buy by the customer as well as energy. And then the third one is for us to establish a market mechanism. In this case, Indonesia is going to continue uh, abide with our commitment and at the, at the same time also working with all parties in order for us to be able to develop uh, the regulatory framework, policy framework, and the implementation in a credible and coherent way. The energy transition mechan mechanism is ambitious plan that enable to upgrade Indonesia energy infrastructure and to accelerate the clean energy transition toward net zero. We also need low cost funding to build the new renewable energy and respond to the growing demand. In fact, this morning, I was come from the breakfast meeting in which private sector talking about how they can also accelerate and support this net zero commitment. 100 trillion over there, but those 100 trillion is not channeling to the country, then it will not deliver this net zero uh, uh, emission uh, commitment. So for us, how we are going to also uh, creating regulatory framework as well as to put enabling environment within the proposed ETM platform, such as role of Indonesia Special Mission Vehicle and also Indonesia Investment Authority to play a catalytic role. 
We also need to build a policy mix from political economy perspective. Janet Yellen mentioned earlier, this really required a carbon pricing, which is through market mechanism, in which uh, in Indonesia, government regulation has already issued to starting the economic value of carbon. This will start the market mechanism for carbon in Indonesia, and that will start building our credibility and uh, reputation in order to use market me mechanism to facilitate this transition. Our parliament also has recently agreed to start introducing carbon price and carbon cap and trade as well as carbon tax by the legislation of our tax rule harmonization law. This is a very real progress for, uh, for me personally as a finance minister because we get the political support to introduce this very important and strategic instrument. Through the carbon cap and tax, we will implement in stages a roadmap that will prepare Indonesia uh, to commit our net zero uh, uh, emission. We will start with a very low price first, uh, which is around $2, but we will continue to develop according, of course, with the same carbon globally, there should not be a fragmented price. Um, we are also ready to take another significant initial step that is something that we want to put in credible scenario to communicate also very clearly our position on the domestic stakeholder. Indonesia is the biggest also coal producer. We also still continue dominated with the coal uh, power. So for us to be able to establish communication and communicate clearly the direction of po policy is going to be very critical. Because without political support and coordination, it is impossible for Indonesia to be able to establish as well as to implement this transition of the energy in a credible way. And that's why we've already now working together with the business sector. We also learned that the pre-feasibility study on the ETM in Indonesia has been completed and full feasibility study is currently being conducted to finalize the financial structure of the ETM and identify candidate coal plans for inclusion in the pilot program. Even our president and coordinating minister has identified the coal plan that will be retired soon, and that's definitely a very good start for us to actually test this ETM uh, in action. The ETM may also well be highlighted and showcased on the G20 process in which Indonesia will hold presidency, uh, which is going to also carrying the theme of recover together, recover stronger. We believe that the cooperation, especially in addressing this issue climate change, will only be uh, delivered when all party is going to also deliver a credible plan and credible commitment. So I will, uh, would like to again uh, congratulate ADB for this very important initiative and Indonesia will continue to strive to become a leading by example country and wish that similar commitment would be made by other development partner and countries in the region and globally. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Minister Srimulyani. I think our work at ADB has made so much easier. Everybody we meet says, well, Minister Srimulyani was just here talking about ETM. So that's made our job much easier. So thank you. Uh, the, your only rival in, in sort of support of this initiative is Secretary Dominguez, so I have the privilege of asking him to, to speak next. Secretary Dominguez, please. My friend, <coughs> Honorable Sri Mulyani Indrawati, <coughs> Minister of Finance of Indonesia, Honorable Helen Wheatley, Secretary of the Treasury of the UK, Mr. Masa Asakawa, President of the Asian Development Bank. Partners from the private sector, distinguished guests, good morning. Today, we are launching a landmark project that will allow the Philippines to accelerate its transition from coal to clean energy in, just, in a just and affordable manner. This is one of the practical projects we are ready to implement to fully realize our ambitious goal 
of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 75% in 2030. The Philippines accounts for only three-tenths of 1% of global carbon emissions. But as an archipelago sitting on the typhoon belt and the Pacific Ring of Fire, we are most vulnerable to the adverse effects of climate change. The 2020 World Risk Index ranks the Philippines ninth among 181 nations in the world as the most affected country from extreme weather conditions. Each year, an average of 20 typhoons hit the country, bringing torrential rains, violent winds, and extreme floods. Due to rising sea levels, we are sinking four times faster than the global average. Weather-related events cause losses and damages amounting to about $1 billion U.S. billion every year. The Philippines is therefore very determined to do its utmost to fulfill its commitment to combat climate change through practical projects on the ground. Coal accounts for 54% of our energy mix, which makes it the largest source of greenhouse gases in the Philippines. In 2019, coal accounted for 48% of carbon dioxide emissions in the country. Thus, reducing dependence on coal power is the fastest way to cut our carbon emissions. The shift from coal dependent to renewable energy sources requires an effective financing framework to be even imaginable. We are happy to be working with the Asian Development Bank and some private sector partners in, the devel in developing the innovative ETM or Energy Transition Mechanism Project. This is envisioned to become the largest emission mitigation program in the world. This project will help us to accelerate the retirement of coal plants in the country by at least 10 to 15 years on the average through innovative financing mechanisms. It is intended to boost the growth of renewable energy in an equitable, scalable, and market-based approach. In the coming period, the ETM partners will jointly conduct a full feasibility study focusing on the optimal business model for the Philippines. The project will bring together the financial resources from multilateral banks, the private institutional investors, philanthropic organizations, and long-term investors to trigger our decisive shift from de for de towards decarbonization. A clean energy transition in the Philippines will attract investments in renewable energy, create jobs locally, and promote national growth. We have a unique opportunity in Mindanao to demonstrate our carbon reduction commitment. In Mindanao, the hydropower source has a huge potential. The government is in the process of rehabilitating the Agus Pulangi uh, hydropower plant to improve its generating capacity. As we increase its generating capacity, capacity, the ETM project will help us acquire coal-fired power plants on the island to repurpose them. This will shift most of our energy requirements in Mindanao to hydropower. There will soon be numerous investments op investment opportunities for renewable energy in the region. Mindanao will showcase an earth-friendly future that can be replicated in other areas of the Philippines and even countries around the world. Together with the Asian Development Bank, the Philippines is pioneering an innovative model that will set a global standard in transitioning to a cleaner energy future. The time for debate and merely discussing climate change theories is over. Today, we are focusing on applied solutions and workable programs to quickly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We have a planet to save and not much time to do it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Secretary Dominguez. And, and we couldn't agree with you more that the time for, for talk is over and the time for action is here. Uh, President Asakawa, please.
Okay. Uh, Your Excellencies, uh, Minister Sri Muriani, uh, Secretary uh, Dominguez, uh, Secretary of Treasury, uh, Ms. Uh, Helen Wetterly, and colleagues uh, here today uh, representing Finance Office and the private sector. Good morning. I am very much honored uh, to uh, join you to mark uh, the partnership launch of our energy transmission mechanism, ATM. Uh, this is a groundbreaking uh, initiative, I, I believe so, uh, that will accelerate uh, the transition from coal uh, to, to clean energy. Uh, let me discuss with you uh, briefly why uh, our shared uh, commitment uh, to climate action is so badly needed and, and how ETM uh, will support a collective action that guides us uh, towards a greener and more sustainable future. ETM promises uh, to become a key component of ADB's uh, overall, overall commitment to take bold and urgent action against climate change. As I announced last month, uh, we are now raising our ambition to deliver 100 billion US dollars uh, in cumulative uh, climate financing between tw uh, 2019 and 2030, uh, including uh, 34 billion US dollars dedicated to adaptation pro projects. My friends, sadly, sadly, Asia and the Pacific is vulnerable, so vulnerable to, uh, to some of the most uh, dis destructive effects of climate change. And these impacts are expected to worsen. At the same time, our region is the source of more than 50% of uh, annual uh, global green gas, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Because of this, we need to recognize that the battle against climate change will be won or lost in Asia and the Pacific. ADB's 2021 energy policy, our new policy, reflects uh, our decision, firm decision, to formally withdraw uh, from financing new coal-fired fire, uh, power plants. However, we must also face the sovereign uh, reality uh, that legacy coal-fired uh, power plants are the single largest source of green gas, greenhouse gas emissions. And in Asia, uh, these plants are, are relatively young. Uh, if not retired from operation, they will last for decades, uh, blocking a meaningful pathway uh, to reduce emissions and make space uh, for renewable energy. So it is so clear that if we do not address emissions from existing, existing coal power plants, uh, we will not uh, meet the Paris Agreement uh, targets. So faced with this enormous challenge, I am very pleased to highlight uh, the potential of this ETM uh, to catalyze uh, private capital and accelerate uh, the transition to clean, uh, clean energy. ETM, as you may know it, uh, is a public-private uh, finance vehicle uh, with two main goals. First, lowering uh, emissions through early retirement of coal-fired power plants. And second, unlocking uh, new investments uh, for, uh, for sustainable renewable energy. Uh, let me briefly describe our ambition for ETM going forward. First, ADB is joining the government of Indonesia and Philippines uh, to formally launch a partnership today to pilot ETM in Southeast Asia. I am so thankful uh, to the government of US, UK, Japan, and Denmark, stakeholders from the private sector and philanthropic foundations uh, who are uh, joining us uh, in support of this very important effort. Uh, the pilot will seek uh, to retire or repurpose five to seven uh, coal-fired power plants in the pilot countries in the near terms. Uh, repurposed uh, plants will be surely converted to renewable energy uh, generation or alternative uses. Second, once it is scaled up, ETM has a potential, huge potential, uh, to be the largest carbon deduction model uh, in the world. For example, retiring 50%, 5-0, of coal power plants over the next 10 to 15 years in Indonesia, the Philippines, and the Vietnam, for, in those three countries, could 
cut 200 million tons of CO2 emissions per year, uh, the equivalent of uh, taking 61 million car off the road. So ETM, uh, we align uh, with ADB's ongoing work to support uh, policy reforms and regulations that promote a permanent shift to clean energy while meeting ex existing and future energy needs. And finally, third, ADB will prioritize a just transition, as uh, Minister Srimuliani mentioned, that alleviates uh, the potential environmental and socioeconomic impacts of ETM uh, by considering populations that are affected directly or indirectly, uh, including workers and communities. To help design and deliver op appropriate just transition uh, measures, we will establish an advisory uh, group composed of leading experts and civil society stakeholders. So in concluding, uh, let me mention, let me express my, once again, deep appreciation to all who have turned this uh, exciting uh, new initiative into a re reality. Uh, we look forward to working with our partner governments, the private sector, and all stakeholders as a, as a climate bank uh, for Asia and the Pacific, so that our region can achieve a successful transition to clean, reliable, and affordable energy. Thank you very much for your questions. Thank you so much, uh, President Massa. Uh, if I could ask uh, the three of you to please stand for a picture, uh, we'd be very grateful for that. Thank you. And then I would be very grateful if we could have joined two of our, you know, our new friends and extraordinary supporters of ETM, Per Higginis, CEO of the IKEA Foundation, and Raj Shah, president of the Rockefeller Foundation, who launched the Global Energy Alliance yesterday, which we're looking forward to welcoming, hopefully, as a supporter of ETM. If we could join you for a picture with, with the ministers, if that would be okay. Thank you. Nice to see you. How are you? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Huh? Thank you. Okay. We're now, um, as as President uh, Massa mentioned, um, we we're very lucky to have President. Please feel free to stay here, or if you'd like to take a seat, we're going to play a couple of videos. Whatever's more comfortable. Thank you. We've been very grateful, uh, as President Massa mentioned, to enjoy the support of several governments, including Denmark uh, and Japan. And so next, uh, we are going to play a, a message uh, from the Honorable Jeppe Kofud, the Minister of Foreign Affairs for Denmark. We're here to discuss one of the most important issues right now, phasing out coal. This is a top priority for the Danish government. And we will announce new substantial support to the phasing out at the Energy Day on November 4th. Coal has been the greatest source of greenhouse gas emissions throughout history. Accelerating action on coal is crucial to keeping global temperature rise within 1.5 degrees. According to the IPCC, by 2030, coal electricity generation must fall by four-fifths globally and completely uh, in developed countries. The Danish government is giving top priority to assist partner countries in their green energy transition. Denmark has established green partnership with, for example, India, Indonesia and Vietnam, where our cooperation includes technical assistance to promote the deployment and scaling up of renewable energy. We have no excuses. Coal is not even the cheapest power source for the global economy. Two-thirds of the world's 7.9 billion people live in a country where wind and solar energy are the lowest cost sources of electricity. The green transition will not just be to the benefit of the climate and health of people, but also to the wallets of consumers. And we need innovative and bold solutions 
to implement this transition. That is why I'm very pleased to be here. The ETM program provides a scalable and market-based method to accelerate the retirement of coal-fired power plants and to increase investments in renewables. This is exactly what we need. And I will follow the deployment of and development of ETM closely and I'm confident that it can contribute to the enormous challenge lying ahead of us. Let's together consign coal to history. Thank you. Another message, we're very grateful to uh, Mr. Masato Kanda, Vice Minister of International Affairs at the Ministry of Finance, uh, Japan. If we could play that message. Excellencies, distinguished guests, dear colleagues and friends. I'm honored to speak today on behalf of the Minister of Finance, Japan, at this invaluable occasion. Climate change is a global challenge. To address this challenge, Japan and many other advanced economies have announced a target of net zero or carbon neutral by 2050. In order for the international community to achieve the global goal of remaining within the 1.5 degrees limit, it is also essential that developing countries make collective efforts on reducing greenhouse gas emission in line with the Paris Agreement. Many global leaders from both public and private sectors are gathering in Glasgow to tackle this global challenge. On this historical opportunity, I'd like to extend my heartfelt congratulations on the launch of the Energy Transition Mechanism, or ETM, today. Japan has been emphasizing the importance of transition finance to achieve the 1.5 degrees goal, especially in the Asia and the Pacific region, where countries heavily rely on coal-fired electricity. Japan, therefore, fully supports the innovative ETM, which plays a critical important role in promoting the smooth transition from coal to cleaner energy while ensuring universal access to affordable and reliable energy. In this regard, I'm pleased to announce Japan's commitment on US $25 million contribution to the ETM. I believe that our grand contribution will become a seed money to attract a much larger amount of other donors' contribution and private investment so that we can achieve the successful transition by our important partners, including Indonesia and the Philippines. Currently, Japan, in collaboration with the US, UK, and other countries, works on the accelerated coal transition in developing countries by using the future reflow streams of Green Technology Fund through the new CIF capital market mechanism. We plan to support the ETM through this scheme as well, in addition to our grant contribution. Japan welcomes ADB's new energy policy which announces the withdrawal from financing new coal-fired power and promote the low-carbon transition in the region through best available options, including natural gas. We also support ADB's decision to boost its climate finance target to $100 billion by 2030. Those recent ADB's efforts are well aligned with Japan's proposal on MDB's support in the energy sector, which we announced last month. Our proposal supports MDB's decision not to support new coal project, and also urges MDBs to support developing countries to implement the best available options with the lowest cumulative GHG emission identified in their ambitious energy transition pathways. ADB is expected to play a leading role as a climate change frontier in the region under the strong leadership of President Massa. And Japan will further strengthen our cooperation with ADB to support developing countries' efforts for tackling global climate challenge. We believe that the ETM will find the ways to accelerate decarbonization and expect other donor countries and development partners to also join this innovative mechanism to achieve the 1.5 degrees goal. Thank you. Thank you uh, to Vice Minister Kanda. And uh, the announcement he just made is the first official sector uh, grant financing uh, for ADB. We're very, very grateful for that. <laughs> Next, I'd like to invite uh, onto the stage uh, Dr. Raj Shah uh, from the Rockefeller Foundation and for some brief remarks. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome. Uh, well, welcome and good morning, everyone. And wow, uh, in a meeting that uh, many around the world criticize for being too, too much talk and not enough action, uh, this uh, morning session is all action. And 
I think uh, we owe a big debt of gratitude to uh, Minister Srimalyani, to Secretary uh, Dominguez, and to President Asakawa. And I think we also all collectively owe a big debt of gratitude to Ahmed Saeed, the Vice President, who's our, our host here for uh, really being the innovator to make so much of this happen. Uh, yesterday, we had the chance to launch uh, the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet. And that alliance has brought philanthropic partners like the Rockefeller Foundation, the IKEA Foundation, and the Bezos Earth Fund together to support multilateral development banks, development finance institutions, and ultimately uh, our partner countries to accelerate an energy transition in a way that really does lift people up and create opportunity. And I think this specific energy transition mechanism, which is a priority project of this new alliance, illustrates three core values that I hope we can live up to in many other collaborations. The first is partnership. Uh, these efforts only work if they are led by countries uh, themselves, and country leaders have to do, and have done in this case, significant political work uh, and significant design and structuring work to make sure that these programs uh, make sense for their countries, for their politics, for their communities, and ultimately for lifting people up. And uh, we're proud to stand behind and in support and with country leadership. The second is innovation. And this is such an extraordinary example of how public and private and philanthropic and multilateral development bank resources can come together to be so much more than any one of those individual institutional types could finance on their own. And I hope we can learn from this and apply it in other settings, uh, even as we build this out in a more uh, effective way going forward. And the third is results. And this is perhaps the hardest part. I think there's still some design work to do for our uh, favorite project, the ETM. Uh, and there's clearly a need to show the world uh, that these types of collaborations can deliver real results. Maybe that means starting with a specific coal plant in Indonesia or a specific project in the Philippines in Mindanao, as was mentioned. And uh, the more we can come back to settings like this and illustrate how these collaborations led to concrete results against carbon reduction, access expansion, and ultimately the creation of jobs, the more momentum we can build so we can have many other public sector donors and, and more importantly, other private investors stand with and stand behind these efforts. So let me just offer my congratulations to all of you. Uh, it reiterate how proud we are as, as a new alliance uh, to come together to learn from you and your efforts and to support this specific program. And I wish us all collective luck as we go forward. Thank you. Asa, if we could just have you join Raj and just take a picture to commemorate the signing of the Memorandum of Understanding uh, between Rockefeller and Global Energy Alliance and ADB. If you could. Yeah, it's already been okay. signed. We just, uh, <laughs> it's a prop. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, our next session is going to be uh, a discussion, and if I could invite on the stage uh, Dr. Naoko Ishii, um, former head of the Global Environment Fund, Elizabeth Yi. Uh, Executive Vice President of the Rockefeller Foundation and, and Noel Quinn, uh, CEO of HSBC. Should I pull up a... Yep. Oh, I think we're fine. We got four, right? Yeah. Okay, and then while we're getting settled, we're going to hear a message uh, from uh, Mayor Bloomberg. Uh, about the ATM. If we could just put that on the screen and then, then we'll get started. Hello, everyone. The science is clear. To avoid the worst impacts of climate change, we have to speed up the transition away from coal. That means finding new ways to drive more funding to clean energy and knock down barriers that stand in the way of phasing out coal. Bloomberg Philanthropies is working with partners to help do just that, including in Southeast Asia. And I want to thank the Asian Development Bank for its work, which will bring many benefits. Cutting coal use doesn't only reduce risks we face from climate change. 
It also reduces air pollution that kills so many people, including in Asia. Today's announcement will help to jumpstart more climate finance that helps to retire coal plants faster and improve many lives. So thanks again for your leadership and partnership, and I'm looking forward to seeing the progress ahead. All the best. Thank you. Uh, thank you to, to Mayor, M Mayor Bloomberg. Now, uh, there's one person I really wish was with us today, and, and you know, COVID has many tragedies, some large, some small, but, but one of those in my mind is that Don Kanak, uh, who is the person who came up with this idea uh, and without whom I don't think any of us would be here today, uh, isn't able to join us physically. Uh, but we do have the opportunity to hear from Don virtually. So before we turn to the panel discussion, uh, we'll, we'll hear from Don. Thank you, Ahmed. I'm excited to be here today. I first wrote about the energy transition mechanism last year, after several years of researching and considering various perspectives. The climate, Asia's need for accessible, affordable energy, challenges faced by consumers, by participants in the energy sector, and by government, from a technical, from a financial, and from political perspectives. Having spent over 30 years working in investments and insurance across the Asia region, and also on issues related to climate and conservation, I understand the challenge of growing and greening at the same time. It's complex and it's difficult. I'm thrilled with the progress that the Asian Development Bank has made taking the ETM idea and putting it on a path toward implementation. With the right principles and enabling frameworks in place, I believe ETM has the potential to empower developing countries to make a transition away from coal to renewable energy without sacrificing other development needs. If we're to meet the climate challenge, all countries have to move faster and fairly. This is the principle behind the ETM. Developing countries, especially low and low middle income countries, need access to financing and to technology. They also need an institutional partner, ideally a multilateral bank, not only to mobilize funds, but also to make sure that the funds and the technology and the expertise are secure during the multi-year transition period that's required, through thick and thin, through economic cycles, through pandemics and other crises. This long-term commitment by a credible institution such as the ADB, partnering with a host government, is key to assuring that citizens have access to reliable, affordable energy and that new opportunities are created for affected communities and workers. Critical to ETM success, more importantly to energy transition success, is close collaboration between the public sector, the private sector, philanthropy and NGOs at the local and international levels. To see all those represented here today is especially gratifying. Thanks to you, Ahmed, to President Asakawa, and to all your dedicated colleagues for taking leadership on this initiative. I look forward to a stimulating and inspiring panel discussion by this esteemed group of panelists. Many thanks. Thank you uh, so much to Don, not just for those remarks, but for, for all of the uh, lifetime of insight that, that he put into developing this concept. You know, one of the great things I think about going on journeys of discovery like this uh, is that you find extraordinary fellow travelers. Uh, and I'm very grateful to the three people uh, on the stage to me today, both as individuals and as representatives of important institutions, uh, for becoming fellow travelers in this journey to find an equitable and fair transition away from coal. Um, so thank you, uh, all three of you. Thank you so much. Um, well, maybe just to open it up, uh, I think, you know, one question obviously is what does success look like? Uh, what are we trying to achieve? Um, and sort of happy to let whoever wants to put, uh, wants to go first, uh, offer a thought. <laughs> Naoko, perhaps we'll start on the far end. You, you've had the, you know, you've, you've been a leader in, in this space for a very, very long time. Uh, yeah. and would love to get your perspective. Yeah, no, first and foremost, I really would like to congrats, <laughs> to, to congratulate everybody in this room, including Dan, who is the originator of this idea, and also all allies and coming together to support this. Actually, it's just an eye ago that we all talk about this will be our joint dream, and we all hope that uh, this event, uh, this scheme, be launched at the COP 
26. Now we made it. So it's just <laughs> amazing that, the, uh, that this realization of the joint redeem. Here at the COP, I, I hear the three challenges that uh, the obviously how to close the gap of the, at the uh, emission gap at the pledge level, but more importantly, how to translate this pledge to actually the action or performance based on the MRB. So that is the, uh, the tough one, but the third one, which is so beautifully laid out already by Srimoniani and the, the ministers, is, is on how you can craft this transition, that then it's transition of, it's, uh, it's not just the energy transition, it's a transition of the entire economy or the society, because we need to really move out from this fossil fuel-based economy to us, that then, <laughs> clean energy uh, based economy and as uh, Suri said it's just not just an energy on the price it's just not how to reskill the entire economy of the workforce so it needs an entire redesign of the society so to me the success is that if we can not only just uh, implement uh, uh, this this uh, beautiful uh, uh, the, the facility but how you can really chart uh, this uh, the transition pathway and uh, based on this uh, energy transition. And I think the key to success is to craft that transition pathway, which comes from, needs to be supported by all you know, key um, uh, participants in this room, private and public and the finance and the policy makers and citizens, because citizens need to own it. So that then I think that is the key to success. And if we just miss one part of this entire package, the parties will not really um, uh, maximize its impact. But then um, um, I really want to congratulate that then, uh, everybody in this room to make it as a natik start that then of this uh, beautiful initiative, including you, um, Ahmed. Uh, thank you, Naoko. And I think uh, we were grateful for the kind words, but also you've also painted a picture of, you know, the complexity and the scale yeah. of, of the enormity of what lies ahead. And maybe we'll just work our way left. Uh, Noel, thank you so much for joining us and for your institution's support of developing uh, this, this model. From your perspective at HSBC, what does success for ETM look like? Ah, oh, simple. Uh, early, early retirement, is that working? Yeah. yeah. Early retirement of coal assets. Um, I mean, the objective is simple. The mechanism is complex. Uh, and let's not confuse the two. Yeah. Um, our objective is straightforward. If we can get an earlier and a materially earlier retirement of coal assets in countries, that's a good outcome. If we can also get a replacement of that energy supply by renewable energy, that's a good outcome. The devil is now in the detail. We've got to work through the detail of how we make that become a reality. And you know, we're all under immense pressure, uh, governments, financial institutions, power companies. You know, nobody really wants to be seen to be in the financial services sector to be financing coal assets. So why would I be interested in this initiative? Because you're retiring coal assets earlier. Yep. So you look beyond the short-term issues to the ultimate goal, and you have belief in the ultimate goal of retiring coal early, replacing coal with alternative renewable energy sources. That's the right thing to do. And therefore, you look through that, into that, and you've got to, we've got to work through the detail now of how we bring this to a reality and help governments transition. Now, we've also got to be re, have a re, reality check on energy still needs to be provided to developing markets. They need the source of energy to power their economies. They need alternative sources of energy, so we've got to fuel that growth, their economic development, with new sources of energy. And this is a means by which we can make that happen. This is an accelerator on an ambition that is a good ambition. Yeah, thank you, Noel. And I think nothing difficult happens without leadership, and we're very grateful to you for your, you. For your strong leadership uh, at HSBC. Um, Liz, uh, you uh, announced an extraordinarily interesting and fascinating uh, you know, new partnership yesterday that breaks new ground. Um, would love to hear from, from your perspective on, on what success would mean. 
Sure, sure, thanks. And thanks, thank you, Ahmed, for having us. And, and congratulations to President Asakawa and the team on this incredible mechanism, which I think has a chance to really transform energy uh, in, a, in a very important region of the world. We, we did, as Raj said, um, we launched the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet yesterday with the real uh, focus on disrupting what's there and bringing together the critical actors from the public sector, like Noko, you mentioned, the private sector, to, to come together and really think about how we can both change um, energy access as well as accelerate energy transition. I think for us, that was why the energy transition mechanism was just such an exciting opportunity because it enables us to do exactly as Don said, grow and green at the same time. And so, um, you know, as we think about success, we set forth some specific metrics for the, for the Global Energy Alliance. Um, we we want to focus on ensuring that we reduce carbon by 4 billion tons. We want to make sure that we actually increase access for the billion people who either don't don't have energy access or experience intermittency uh, and can't really join the modern economy. And then really think about, um, as Noel said, what are the jobs that need to be created, both through the new economy, through the new green economy, but also thinking about the displacement um, of potential workers that are in the coal industry. So success for us is really looking at that system um, and really thinking about how we can drive change, uh, both from a, a fossil fuel decommissioning perspective, but also making sure that we do it in a just and equitable and an affordable way. All right, thank you, thank you, thank you, Liz, and, and thank you, of course, for your, your support. Uh, it's, it's so critical to our success as a, as a collective group. Um, several of you commented on the fact that this is, com th as you said, Noel, the problem is simple, the solution is complex. Mm -hmm. And with complexity always comes risk. Mm -hmm. uh, what do we think are um, the biggest risks that we need to be thinking about and we need to design around? I think, Nalko, you already highlighted one <laughs> at the outset, which is ensuring that this is a, a, a shared process. Um, uh, but perhaps you want to elaborate on that or, or maybe mention some other risks and we can mm. we can just follow the same order again. Yeah, actually, this is called the energy transition mechanism. But to me, it's entire economy and the society transition mechanism because it's only not the en energy to be transformed because our economy, your economy, their economy is based on this fossil fuel based. So that it's not just that the energy needs to be transformed, but it needs to be Trans, uh, that the entire industrial structure and the societal structure needs to be transformed. And as Suri said, it's really a design issue that how you can design this entire pathway in a very credible way, and it involves a huge investment, not only just taxation and budget, but also the, uh, how you can create this uh, uh, investment flow both from public and the private. So that complexity, and if you can bring everything together with support from the entire citizens, so that is needed, and that is, to me, it's a main risk. And the reason even my home country is struggling, that what is a credible transition pathway going forward? Yes. And uh, I was actually, um, I was so envious that listening to Suli that uh, you, already, you already got a uh, parliament approval yeah. of the way forward, <laughs> taxation that, uh, and, and other measures. And uh, I think that uh, that political leadership coming together with uh, the goodwill of the business, I think that is a key. And I think that uh, if there is any risk involved, I think that is a risk that uh, the things that the parties be falling apart. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, Noel, maybe we go to you next. Um, Probably two risks, uh, and then I want to offer a comment about the role of the ADB. Uh, one risk is people don't understand the motive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They misread the motive. They see this purely as a financial engineering exercise to move coal assets off of one balance sheet onto another, mm. and they don't look through to the end goal. That, that I think, is a risk, and you know. We can't ignore stakeholders. We all have stakeholders, and stakeholder perceptions are important. So turning this great concept into a very detailed, clearly communicated execution plan where the old underlying motives become a reality, I think is important. Because we have to bring people with us on this journey. And I'm 100% committed to anything that accelerates the transition. Mm -hmm. Um, 
The second risk, I suppose, is there isn't a replacement energy source developed fast enough for these assets that are going to be retired. So we have to funnel the available funding that's created by this initiative into the development of alternative energy sources at scale that are affordable. And then my comment, um, I think the ADB should be congratulated, you should be congratulated on the innovation you're bringing to the public-private partnership. You really are, as a, a development institution, looking beyond today's boundaries and creating mechanisms to bring that new world into reality. And uh, of all of the dialogue we're having, I, I gotta congratulate you on the, the innovation, the ambition, the creativity that you're bringing to the role of public-private pri public partnerships. Um, so um, that doesn't answer your question, but it does give you a compliment. So well, we're, 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 <laughs> thank you. We're, thank we're you. never going to say no to a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, I think you've got, you're developing a model that needs to be replicated in so many places, because yeah. this is not unique uh, to Asia. This is a challenge that we all face, mm -hmm. how to bring public and private sector together to accelerate the transition. And you know, you mentioned, Noel, um, you mentioned uh, trust. And I've always felt that one of the ingredients that our institution has mm -hmm. that makes it a unique enabler of public-private partnerships is that in a world within which trust is a fast disappearing commodity, we still have some. Mm -hmm. Now we have to earn it every day. You don't take it as a given. Um, and there are constituencies that trust us more and trust us less. But nevertheless, as an institution, um, we've got far more degrees of flexibility on, on the chessboard than others yeah. in today's heavily trust-constrained world. But we've got to then turn that into real things, yeah. Correct. Um, which is uh, it's an extraordinarily powerful intangible asset. Um, Liz, what do you see as, as the risks? I, uh, your comment, Noel, brought me back to the first time I met Ahmed and we had lunch in Bryant Park and I mm -hmm. said, what is this ETM and how does it work and how can we also get it to scale? Because I think you're exactly right, which is we're on the precipice of something really incredible and the chance to, to think about how we can use these pilots as opportunities to, to both make things happen for the Philippines, Indonesia, and across Asia in, in the ADB portfolio, but thinking about how we can actually build something that drives private sector, further investment from private sector, um, an incentive to actually participate. I, I think this is the chance. Um, it could potentially be a risk, but I think it's also an opportunity. My team bought me a mug that said, it crossed out problem and wrote opportunity. I think that's the opportunity at hand. Um, and I think the other piece that uh, is incredibly important is exactly, as you said, Noel, technology. Yeah. Uh, you know, Right now, we don't have the technology to, to deal with all the potential intermittency, to deal with, um, you know, but just to create the stability uh, in, in the uh, generation portfolio that coal does. And so thinking about where we need to further invest um, and accelerate the development, whether we, where we can also invest to take it to scale. Not everyone is grid connected, um, so really thinking about those portfolios um, and, and those people as well. A and I think uh, Naoko's point on the social side is so critically important. I think that could potentially be, could create failure to launch um, if there is e economic instability that comes from a displacement of coal across the entire vertical from mm. the actual generation and transmission fleet, but also thinking about um, on the other side, the mining industry and all uh, and, the, and the people that work there. So I think we really need to, to take a systemic approach to how we how we displace coal um, and fossil fuels in general. But so one, I'm going to ask, and Liz, I'm going to start on your side and work way back, sorry, but <laughs> just one last question. If there's one thing you said Keep this one thing in mind as you move, as you leave COP26 and, and you look to the future of this. What is, what is the one thing that you would ask us to, to not lose sight of? It's probably what I tell my kids. Take risk, right? right. Do the work, get it done, try it on. Um, and you know, f work hard and fail fast and fix it. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think we don't have any time to continue to talk. We've got to take action. I and mean, we've got to give each other the space and grace that maybe solutions aren't the right ones, but at least we're trying to really change the climate uh, for future generations. Oh, that's a great one. No? Execution. Yeah. And execution with material difference. Right. Um, otherwise, we're in danger of just talking a good talk, but not actually delivering. So I'd put it down. We've got to turn this now into very tangible execution that delivers substantive benefits. 
I'm getting the feeling that your direct reports must get every once in a while. <laughs> 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 they, they do it to me as yeah. well. <laughs> <laughs> but very, very important, absolutely. <laughs> now, okay. Yeah. Rise to the expectation from stakeholders towards the ADB to take the colleges leadership okay. and show the way or lead the way. Yeah, you can do it and we can do it together. Thank you. And before you leave the stage, I just wanted, we were very uh, grateful to have with us uh, the Honorable Amin Aslam, Minister of Environment for Pakistan. And if you would be just kind enough to say a couple of words, uh, you know, from a perspective of a country that is thinking about these problems, uh, and ETM would be grateful if, uh, if, if you would, you know, uh, honor us with your perspective. Yes, Thank uh, thanks a lot, Ahmed. And uh, uh, sorry, I just got late for the panel. but. Uh, I think uh, what you're trying to do over here is extremely innovative. It's uh, out of the box, and it is the cutting edge uh, thought process that we, you know, talk about in the in the plenary negotiations should be happening, but it's not happening outside. So I would, I mean, really like to commend ADB for uh, you talked about the risks. I think this is the risk that they are taking that they're going into un uncharted territory when you talk of the ETM. Uh, I got uh, first knowledge of it because you know I could I could sense a gap. Uh, on the global scale uh, that the ATM is plugging in uh, because, you know, Pakistan, I'll give you the example of Pakistan, is a country that is politically committed to a clean energy future. Uh, we've set a target of 60% of our energy mix to go uh, zero carbon by 2030. But for the rest of the 40%, we would still like to get unlock unlocked out of uh, the existing uh, pathway but we want it to be a just energy transition. And I think that it's the just part that the ATM is trying to address over here. You don't want to be penalizing countries who want to get onto a cleaner pathway and are locked into 30-year uh, you know, uh, IPP contracts with 60% mm -hmm. capacity payments to be paid even if you shut the plant down. So that's the, that's the uh, you know, uh, uh, gap that the ATM is filling in, and it's a huge gap. And I can assure you that once you are uh, through the financial, you know, you, you'll need some financial uh, uh, wizardry to get this to happen, uh, the one uh, you talked about. But once you've done the first model, mm -hmm. I think there'll be lots of takers for this. Mm -hmm. So uh, I really want to congratulate you on this. And I was first heard about it in an interministerial talk uh, on one of these uh, Zoom panels I was in. And I heard ADB speak. And as soon as I heard them speak, I, I contacted the ADB and said that we want to be in. And uh, I'm glad that Pakistan, in a very short time, uh, is uh, going to be in the process. Uh, we probably are going to be doing the first feasibility funding. Uh, your team in Pakistan has been very cooperative on that, uh, so that we can screen what are the opportunities available. But we are fully committed to it politically. And I think that I, I, I really, uh, uh, you know, uh, once again admire what ADB is doing. And uh, we not only support it, but I think it's something which will uh, open up a floodgate of opportunities once the first few transactions happen and people really see that uh, megawatt to megawatt it can be done that you can transition in a just manner from uh, polluting or a coal technology into a clean technology thank right. you very much thank you. so first of all uh, thank you to to everyone uh, who joined us today both in person and virtually i want to thank especially the governments of indonesia and the Philippines and, and Finance Minister Sri Mulyani Indrawati and Carlos Dominguez for their advocacy and their strong support, as well as President Massa uh, for his championing of this important initiative. I wanted to draw our conversation to a close uh, with three observations. Uh, first, a successful transition mechanism must meet local needs and be compatible with conditions on the ground to be successful. That is why we are excited that the governments of the Philippines and Indonesia are taking the lead in designing ETM. Second, the battle against climate change will be won or it will be lost, but it will, be, it will happen in Asia. Success will require that we fairly address difficult issues of transition and will not be possible without the type of global cooperation that we've seen here today. And finally, there is much talk about the need for private capital to play a role, but private capital needs the right structures and frameworks <laughs> before it can do its part. That's what we're trying to create with ETM. So thank you to all of our attendees, to our speakers, uh, to everyone watching this live on adb.org. Thank you for joining us for the launch of the ETM Southeast Asia Partnership. Thank you. <laughs>